He's my brother You know He ain't heavy He's my brother Leanne, uh, we can uh, usually just let her sing and then I say amen. <laughs> Let's see if we can beat the Baptists to Lubies or wherever we're going, you know. It's, uh, it's a pleasure to be here. Um, uh, I haven't uh, been here since the days of the VFW Hall. Uh, I left here... Um, to go to San Marcos, and I spent three years serving in San Marcos, uh, and then went to uh, Unity of North Houston, a church where Bill Kreshmer suggested I go. I had never been to a Unity church and hadn't been to a Unity or, or any kind of church for somewhere around 25 years. And I said, just to get him to quit nagging me, I would just, you know, because... <laughs> He can do that. I don't know if you guys have noticed, but Bill talked me into coming to Unity, and Unity of North Houston was the first Unity church I went to, and it was the Unity church where I, uh, I served and where I uh, became ordained. So it's quite a, 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 a squaring the circle or whatever it is we call that thing that happened. I... Uh, I prepared uh, the slides, and I prepared this talk in the early part of the week, uh, and then all that went to heck. <laughs> um, heck is what preachers say when we mean hell. Um, it, it was not a very good week for our friends and our brothers um, who... Um, you know, who experienced multiple assassination attempts. And our Jewish uh, brothers who all they were trying to do was to celebrate the eighth day of life of a male son with a bris. And 11 of them were murdered. And so uh, I'm not one of those unity people who chooses not to pay attention to the news uh, because I believe the news is important because it has a lot of information for us. As we choose to become involved in whatever fashion we choose to become involved, we are serving and doing what Jesus suggested that we do, and we'll talk about that. That is to take care of the Christ. And we know that everyone, yes, including our Jewish friends, our Muslim friends, our atheist friends, are the incarnation of the Christ. Some of them don't know it. And that's okay. They have other ways of saying it also. I'd like to start for a moment just with an opening of prayer as we consider our position, our place in this world of tribalism and sometimes uncontrolled hate. So if you're comfortable, close your eyes and settle in. If you'd like, take a deep breath all together and let that breath go. Continue to breathe, but know that as we breathe together, each individual is inspiring. And together we are conspiring. We're conspiring to build and to grow a world that works for everyone. A world, a world that is based on our understanding of God, that accepts all understandings of God, but recognizes that God is love. God is love. And it is from that space of love that we extend our love beyond our bodies, beyond this room, beyond this city, 
to the entire world. We put the arms of love around all of those who don't recognize themselves as the Christ. All of those who have been affected negatively by individual actions of human beings. And we open ourselves up. We open ourselves up to understanding. We open ourselves up to growth. We open ourselves up to being of service to those who are not living in a world that works for all. We know that world is at hand and it is called heaven. And we say, so it is. So it shall be. So it always shall be. Amen. So the title, for those of you who are much younger, the title comes from uh, Rodney King. Um, I, was in, I was in Los Angeles when uh, the trial, uh, when the verdict, the trial verdict of, of the Rodney King beating hit. Some of you may not remember, but Rodney King was beaten by uh, several police officers and uh, nearly died. And, um, and, and when, the, the, when the verdict came back, um, it was a not guilty verdict. And so many, many people became very, very angry. I remember the juxtaposition of, of, of the, the riots with where I was. I was in a Hyatt Regency just down the street from the Queen Mary in, 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 uh, in Long Beach, California. And everybody was complaining because we were stuck there. We couldn't leave. There was a curfew, and we couldn't leave the hotel. I was there for a conference. And, uh, and, and I remember sitting in a hot tub, drinking wine, watching fires start. And it would just go block by block by block by block. And then the Navy, because there's a Navy base right there, the Navy sent... The Navy sent uh, jeeps out, and they, they had machine guns on the jeeps to protect the Navy base. And I said, my God, you know, this is like being back in Vietnam. But what, what, what I've been thinking about when Rodney King came out at a press conference and just said, can't we all get along? It didn't influence or affect the rioting. Because people... People responded, not responded, people reacted. Reacted to what appeared to be a hate-filled verdict. And they reacted from a place of hate. Now, I've never been in the position of being a minority of any sort. Except when I... Well, this is a whole other story, but I actually spent a bit of time in the Harris County Jail, and I was the only, only white person in my pod among 40. But generally speaking, I'm a tall, straight white man, and so I've never had that experience of that kind of, of abuse. So I don't want to try to speak as if I understand it in any way. But I have to understand, I have to understand that I play a role. I play a role in what's going on in my world. Whether or not you believe that what I put out into the world, what you put out into the world, alters the experience of anybody else in the world, I believe, I believe that I begin peace. I begin it. I begin it. You won't see that on Twitter, by the way. So I thought a little bit about sharing about Brene Brown. She said, you know, it's hard to hate people up close. You know, when I get up close to you and I look at your face, and, and I look at faces that I remember, that I remember from, from being 
uh, here speaking or speaking in San Marcos where people came. It's hard to hate when you're up close. It's hard to hate as you make someone human. You'll notice that most of our politicians didn't talk about the human who did the shooting at the synagogue. They called it evil. Not that it was a human being who for some reason chose to kill other human beings. That's hard to deal with, isn't it? When we sit next to someone, when we hold their hands at the end of the service, it's hard to believe that human beings can harm each other in that kind of way. And so we use other language. We use other language. We use language that says it's evil. Or in churches that I went to when I was a kid, that it was the devil. And of course, you know, in unity, we don't talk about the devil. We don't believe that there is any other power on earth other than God. But human beings have been given this particular power that comes from what Charles Fillmore called the personality and what a lot of people call the ego. And that is this place that is built based upon what we see, what we hear, what we begin to understand. This is the way we understand the world. I have had people in 12-step meetings say, well, all this honesty is really good, except when you get into business. You know, I'm in a real estate business, and I can't be honest. You know, well, then you're not being fully sober, and your potential for serenity is being, is being released because you can't be honest. But St. Francis talked about uh, some very important things in terms of getting human to human. He talked about understanding. That it's not as important for me to be understood as to understand. Now this is very important in your special relationships like the ones in your house. Now I'm gonna use a term that Bill used to use all the time. When you're live in higher power, is trying to tell you that you have done something that he or she is not particularly happy with, you can try to get them to understand. And that puts you in the place of being understood. So I, the way I do that, of course, is I get louder. Because you know if you're louder, your argument works better. Because it's kind of like when you talk to somebody in a foreign country, when you speak a different language. If you talk louder, they will understand you. No, it doesn't work that way, and you know it doesn't. And the true, the truly important thing for us to do in those special relationships, and in all of our human-to-human -human relationships, is to seek to understand. But that gets us into a limited place. Let me see where I am. Okay. That gets us to a limited, a limited place. And the way it is limited is that it puts us in a place of being human to human. It puts us in that place of being, of being uh, uh, not considering our divinity. Now, it's important. It's important to go there. It's important to go to that place. But we have more to do. We have more opportunity that goes beyond. Goes beyond our human to human relationships. Now Francis, you're going to see a picture in a minute of Francis hugging a leper. But it, the picture's wrong. I just couldn't find one that had the right picture. Francis was a soldier. Now Francis wanted to make his daddy proud. It's kind of like me. He joined the army, and he went out and was serving and, and saw all kinds of ugly stuff, and kind of like me, he came home a little bit messed up. And his thing, though, was that he not wanted his dad to be proud, so he kept praying that God would fix him so he could go back out and be in the army some more. I personally had had enough and didn't want to go back and do that anymore. But Francis 
One day after he was well, whoops, man. One day after Francis was well, he, he got off his horse. He wasn't a monk yet. He was still a soldier. And, and here he is in armor, and he gets off. And one of his greatest fears was getting leprosy. And, you know, if you've ever seen a leper with active leprosy, you know it's not something you ever, ever want to have. And so he was afraid, afraid of leprosy. Not that they had leprosy, that he would get it. And so he gets off his horse and he goes and he holds a leper. And at that moment, oh, at that moment, at that moment, he said he realized he was holding the Christ. At that moment, he realized that the Christ was in his arms. And then, as he considered it even more, he realized, he realized not only had he held the Christ, but that he was the Christ. And so what he had to do, what he had to do to go from that human to human experience, to go to the Christ, to the, to Christ experience, is he had to face his fear. He had to face this greatest fear that he had. There were two fears that he had. One is that he couldn't be a soldier anymore and couldn't impress his dad. And two, and two, he was deathly afraid that he was going to get leprosy. And so here, essentially, when he disobeyed orders to keep riding to Rome, he quit being a soldier. And he became a human. And then he became the Christ. And that's where we are. That's our opportunity because if we focus only on our humanness, when we go to pray with a prayer chaplain and we focus only on getting me well, we focus only on getting me a job, we miss, we miss the greatest opportunity we have because when we go from that place of having nothing and accepting that, we have the opportunity to transition to being the Christ. Now some of us, some of us don't have to go to those bad spots. And if you've got that experience, wonderful, wonderful. But if you haven't, know that from those bad spots is those where those opportunities come. Charles Fillmore told us that every desire of the human heart is a call to God. It's a call to God. So the prayer is not about the car. The prayer is about connecting to God. And then when our single point of focus is on God, the world develops the car and all of the possible needs that we have. So he went from soldier to Christ. He faced his fears. He faced his fears. One of the reasons that I don't close my eyes to the news is because I think the news is important for me to know about. Because I need to recognize that there's a lot of fear in the news. A lot of potential fear, but I can't just peek. I got to look at it. When I face my fears, I can't just peek at it. I got to sit with it. I got to put my arm around it. And say, where are we going to go with this? How are we going to be? How are we going to grow together? How are we going to become divine that we already are? Let's go with this. That fear is between me and my divinity. I can't do that. And if I don't recognize my divinity, I can't recognize yours. Oh, yeah, I can say namaste, the Christ in me, recognize or you know, loves the Christ in you, or whatever words I want to use. But it's deep. It's deep. That Christ in you is hidden by years and years. Some of us by decades and decades. And build decades and decades of fears that are between us and the divine. I watched a woman, I watched a woman make her transition. 
a few weeks ago. She knew it was coming. We talked a lot about her fears. And, oh goodness, her greatest fear? Now, she'd been listening to me for a long time. Talk about who we are. What we are. She's been listening to me talk about how living up to another's idea of who we should be was never going to get us to who we truly are. We got to let go of all that. And she said, "Uh uh-huh, I agree, I agree. But her number one fear is that she was going to die bad. She said, I want to die well. I, I, I want to be one of those people who just peacefully slips away. I don't want to be afraid. I don't want... And she just had all these rules about how she was going to die. And I said, oh my goodness, who are you trying to impress? Who are you trying to impress with how well you die? You know, it, it, but it was important to her. You know, she was vice president of something or another and That was important, and it usually came out. It's like me, you know. When you meet me, within five minutes, I'll tell you that I was a helicopter pilot, no matter how many years ago it was. And people sometimes will say, wow, that's impressive. And other people say, hmm. (laughs) But that was an accomplishment. It was a job I had. I made use of some skills and talents and education. But it wasn't who I was. So I retired. And what am I looking at as a retiree? Oh my God, I don't have a job title. I have to go on Facebook and then say, nothing. <laughs> what, what do you, what's your job? Nothing. And, and if that's your job, if you have grown up and lived your life with the idea, I got to be something and I got to be somebody, that's hard. Just last week, I went to my wife. I said, Bobby, I, I'm nobody. And she said, what do you mean you're nobody? You stand up in front of church and tell people you're divine and you're, you know, you're the Christ and all of this. And, and, and I said, yeah, that's what I say. And there is the challenge. And that's the reason I mentioned it again and again and again, because it is a challenge. It's a challenge when you retire. It's a challenge when you have a different job. And it's a challenge when you're working. It's a challenge when you're trying to relate to people. But how many of us go to a cocktail party, introduce yourself and say, hi there. I'm Don Seiler, child of God, father, grandfather, great-grandfather. We don't do that, do we? No, that's not who we are. But it is the truth of who we are, and the more often we go there, the more often we go there without fear of disappearing. One of my friends who retired at 62, because he's an airline pilot before they changed the, the age, and, and, and he retired at 62, and he said, he said, Don, I've disappeared. I've disappeared. And I said, my goodness. How can you live like that? And then three weeks or six weeks ago, I disappeared. And then I realized I came to this understanding that I have to put my arm around that fear of disappearing and say, let's go for a walk. Stay right here with me. Because there's something for me to learn. Something for me to learn deep inside of me, not just learning up here. Not just learning up here where I can talk to you guys about, isn't it wonderful that I am a child of God? Where I can stand up in front of you and say, I'm afraid of just being a child of God. Isn't that weird? It feels weird. It feels like, you know, maybe I need to check in somewhere. I hear there's a nice hospital here in Austin that the state runs. But that kind of fear, that kind of fear is with us all the time. Maybe you're not afraid of just being a child of God or just being divine. But whatever your fears are, we have to deal with those things. 
I was going to talk a lot more about in, our, our individual relationships, but I've become more and more over the past two or three years, more and more Christian. Not in that Jesus Christ died for your sins, but in let me look, listen to what Jesus said. And Jesus said that he was there and being served when we served the thirsty, when we served the hungry, when we served the stranger. Jesus, in his story, he said, this is how you exhibit the Christ, by serving others, by serving others. So my friend here says, now, what club are you going to be in charge of that serves people? And then my Christ says, you just need to go serve. You don't need a position with Habitat for Humanity. You just need a hand that can hold a hammer. You need the love that can allow you to get up on a Saturday morning and go hammer nails for another human being. Uh, love that will allow you to get in your car and spend money for your gas to feed people who can't be fed or can't feed themselves. That's where the Christ is. And I think what Jesus was telling us is the Christ is in every one of us. Not all of you are thirsty or hungry or a stranger. But every one of us feels separate and every one of us has needs. Needs that are our human needs that get in between us living Christ to Christ. So it requires us to take that deep dive, that deep centering dive. Unity talks a lot about our brain, our thoughts. That's really important. But what's most important is that as we focus our thoughts on God and on the Christ within, as we focus our thoughts on that Christ within, then the thoughts that we have truly are the thoughts of divine mind, of that greater divine mind of which we are a part. And what we're seeking is that it all goes together, that it all goes together. I had to skip this part about traffic because you guys, oh yeah, you have a lot of traffic. That's, a hu that's Houston traffic. Um, and so I'm going to ask you to begin to practice this. Now, we can do this by saying that not everybody that drives in Austin is a fully developed God person <laughs> who is manifesting their Christ self. Could we possibly agree on that? So let's go to the space that they are developing godlets. So now we acknowledge the godlet who cut you off or who wouldn't let you merge so that you can get off at Old Torf and had to go all the way down to God knows where down that way before you had to turn around, come all the way back to come here. There's no traffic today, or wasn't when I drove in, but somebody wouldn't let me merge. And it was a godlet. And the cool thing is, is that I, I mention it now, but it really didn't bother me. It was just somebody trying to do what they needed to do. I don't need to even try to understand them. I don't have to understand that they were on their way to take their kid to the doctor or anything. I don't need that understanding. I need to understand just that they are doing the best they can. And that's where we go. Keep Christ in Christmas, golly gee. Somebody, I cut somebody off, you know, because I'm just a godlet myself. And I cut somebody off, and this lady honked her horn and honked her horn and honked her horn and told me something about one person in her life or one something, because she used one finger to talk to me. And when she got in front of me, her car said, keep Christ in Christmas. <laughs> So, it, it, she's a godlet. <laughs> she's doing the best she can based on what she understands and how she understands things.
But what I'm going to want you to do, and I didn't uh, change this, I want you to keep the Christ in every relationship you have. The person you live with. Think about this. Your teenager. Your teenager is the Christ. The Christ. And as the Christ, you know, they, they don't need you to be worrying to death over everything. I have a son who's a musician. And uh, he hasn't had a ha a, 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 an apartment in, I guess, about eight years. He lives in a van. And he lives in a van all over the United States, wherever there's a honky-tonk, beer joint, bowling alley, any place he can play. Even a couple of Unity churches, because he's played at, at, at our church. The first two or three years, all I could do was, well, I, I mean, I did, first of all, I did stealth things like put money in his bank account. And, and then I would get over, you know, like, gosh, Ryan, you know, I could probably help you out with a deposit. He said, but then I got to pay rent. And then the, the you know, he's, he's now 30. He's now 30. And, and he needs me to see him as the Christ, not my kid who doesn't have a house. He needs to see me as the Christ, not my kid who flunked out of UT. Because he's living that way. He's living that way. And teaching me things about being gender fluid and, and a variety of, of things that folks born when I was born never had to think about because nobody spoke of it. But he shows me how to be the Christ. Even more so, he talked to me about doing nothing. He said, Dad, I don't have a job. I don't want a job. All I want to do is have enough money to go from place to place to place to demonstrate my art. He said, there's stories to tell all over the world. And that's my job. That's what I do. So I said, what does that mean for me? I'm not a musician. He said, oh, come on here. You tell stories, just like I do. Just go from place to place to place. You don't need a home. You don't need a job. You need to live. Live the stories you tell. There's some stories right there. I'm sorry I got in the way. I'm going to wrap this up for you guys. You've already not beat the Baptist, so just buckle in. There's some real challenges right there. I've never seen a more divisive po political situation in my life. Even during the Vietnam time, I don't remember feeling quite the same as I do now. And, and so I, first thing I have to recognize is, is, that, is that I get to choose my relationships. Even though I see the Christ in you, if your values don't align with my values, you're not going to live in my house. I get to choose that. I get to choose the energy that is a part of my life. And when I choose how that energy is working for me, or when I see how that energy is working, we can have conversations about how that might change. The very least we do is to make these people human and not the enemy. As soon as, as soon as we begin to point to them, any of them, and say, you are bad, you are evil, then we have stepped away from our Christ. That is your ego, that is your personality, that is not who you are as a child of God. We can't do that. Well, we can. 
you can be just as miserable as you want to be. You get to be that way. Now, I'm not saying that when someone does something that violates your sense of values that you don't do anything. I've marched almost to the limits of my pr knee prostheses because I think there's only a 20,000 mile guarantee or something. <laughs> I've marched, I've written letters, I've made phone calls, but the phone calls I make aren't hateful phone calls because our choices not are about who we're against. Our choices are what we're for. We cannot allow hate to become our language. We cannot allow that to happen. If we expect to participate in the kingdom of heaven. And by the way, the kingdom of heaven ain't up there. It's right here. It's right now. So in closing, when we think about when we think about our significant others. I chose this um, because um, my wife is a real estate attorney. And w when, um, when the Supreme Court uh, first approved gay, uh, gay marriages, um, and sh she would get these phone calls and says, I got, I I I've got a wedding license from two men. What do I do? She said, what do you mean, what do you do? I says, well, it's a gay marriage. How do I do We're in Texas. What do I do? They said, it's not a gay marriage. It's a marriage. It's a marriage. And now we're in this place where we're getting to have phone calls that say, what do I do about a gay divorce? Uh, it's not a gay divorce. I'm sorry. This is where two human beings decided they cannot live together anymore. And it doesn't matter what their sexual orientation is. People sometimes don't get along. Sometimes they discover that their values don't match. Sometimes they discover whatever. However, I wanted to point out here the, the, the body language. Anybody can see the body language? The first thing that came out of the body language that to me was the finger pointing. As soon as that, what kind of weapon is a finger? Just this finger works, actually. What kind of weapon is that? When we point your finger like that at someone, you are putting them in a place. And that place isn't nearby. Even when you stand face to face, it's not close by. You have pushed them away with your finger. And at that point... When we begin to point like that, when we begin to, to push people away in that way, then we get to do what Brene Brown said. They have been pushed away, they are further away from us, and then we get to hate. I don't know how many of you have done this, but many of us in relationships with significant others have gone to a place that sure feels like hate. In our arguments, go to a place that says, you're not right. I'm what's right. When we go to that place, the relationship is truly challenged. But both of you do it. And then you end up with two people who are saying things that they would never say to somebody in Starbucks, that they would never say to somebody here in church, things that they would never say any place but their living room with someone they love. We do it with our kids. We do it with our spouses. We do it with whatever partnership arrangement we have. People we love, we do this to. And when we get separate, we are allowed to not like each other. Quickly, personality and individuality. What happens to us over personality? Remember, that's your homemade self. Preachers, teachers, and parents taught us how to be that way. Individuality is how you showed up as God. It's all hidden. And what happens to us is over time, the more we practice, the more we practice, our personality and our individuality become the same. And I watched it when that lady died. She went away. 
And all that was left was the Christ. And that's where we can go while we're still alive. We can do it. If we put our mind to focus on connecting to the Christ in ourselves and the Christ within every person, our personality begins to go away. All of the fears, all of those needs, the need to drive that car, the need to have those clothes, all of those begin to fall away, and all that's left is the Christ. It's going to happen one way or another. You may as well start now. Go ahead. Look at each other right now and look at the Christ. And every person in this room is the Christ. Is the Christ. And think about yourself. I am the Christ. And you're amazing. Now I have something else to do. Oh yeah, what did I have to do this? I see the joy in you. I see the light shining through. I see the love in you. And so it is. I see the grace in you. See the courage in you. I oh yes, so it is, and so it is, so it is, so it is, so it is. Beauty, power, greatness. You are the voice. Of God. Charles Fillmore. Charles Fillmore told us that our mission is to be all, all that we can imagine God to be. If you can imagine it's possible for God, it's possible for you. You're the healing power. love of God. You are the eyes and the ears of God. You are the hands of God. You are the grace of God. God is. We are. We are all we can imagine God to be the grace. As we begin to accept our truth, we begin to accept the truth of others. We realize our mission. We know who we are. Our job title is to be all, all we can imagine God to be. We are grateful. We're grateful for learning of this power. We're grateful for the opportunity to express our truth. We're grateful for the opportunity to be a part of the peace of the world, a part of building a world that works for all. And so it is. Amen. We at Unity in the Heart of Austin are committed to inspiring people to awaken to their unique divine nature through spiritual teachings, through heart-to-heart -heart connections, through prayer, and through sacred service. And we provide tools, spiritual tools, that allow you to live your best possible life. 
I'm Reverend Tony Roebuck, Minister at Unity in the Heart of Austin, and I truly hope that you are inspired by and that you are transformed by, you enjoy this, this week's spiritual message. And if you would like to leave a donation, a tithe, to help the work of this ministry in supporting you and others like you, then we are truly grateful for your generosity and for helping to make the world a better place. Because we know that life is meant to be good.